Welcome to The Hair Loss Show. Dr. Russell Knudsen and Dr. Vikram Jayaprakash discuss issues relating to hair loss and the medical and surgical treatment of hair loss in both men and women. Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Vikram Jayaprakash. I'm Dr. Russell Knudsen. And welcome to The Hair Loss Show and this is episode number seven. So if you've been with us uh, up till now, we've uh, gone through uh, the causes of hair loss and what happens and the difference between hair loss and shedding. And we've sort of outlined what the, uh, the methodologies are of, of treatment. So we talked about blockers and now we're going to move on to the other side of the equation, which is stimulation therapy. Now, as we talked about in the last episode, stimulation therapy uh, is designed to do exactly what it says. It just stimulates the hair. It doesn't address the underlying issue, certainly in things like male pattern hair loss, androgenic alopecia, why the hair is miniaturizing in the first place. These uh, stimulators don't really address that uh, issue, but what they're doing is they're stimulating the hair. So the first thing we want to talk about is, one, is a product that's... Uh, been in the market for for many years uh, and f until uh, for a long time was this you know was the only therapy really we had for for hair loss and that is minoxidil so minoxidil i mean you know a lot about minoxidil don't you because uh, you were certainly um one of the uh, initial the doctors that were uh, involved in the trials and with minoxidil weren't you that's correct vikram so in 1984 i had the privilege of being one of the five doctors in australia that did the original research in australia using minoxidil as a lotion to apply to balding scalps so the background to the story is that minoxidil was originally designed as a tablet to treat high blood pressure. And one of the unusual side effects that it produced uh, in the method of action that, that, it, uh, that it utilizes was that people became hairier. So 80% of people using oral minoxidil in the dose that they were using for high blood pressure noticed increase in hair generally. So basically, on the arms, the legs, the chest, the face, you name it, they, they got hairy. It was kind of like a werewolf syndrome, if you like. But curiously, they also noticed that some of the male patients who were balding got some uh, reversal of their balding using oral minoxidil. So this stimulated the idea uh, for the pharmacology company to investigate whether you could just stimulate the hairs you want to stimulate. So in that scenario, you put it into a topical lotion right. and you only apply it where you want the hair to work. Now, so this research was started in 1984 and we kind of have an idea how it partly works, but still 35 years later, we don't really exactly know how it works. It has something to do with potassium channels, but it's really beyond uh, you know, uh, either my uh, level of knowledge or your level of knowledge to go any deeper than that. But it certainly does have an effect. So we did the research on both men and women. Australia had the first women's trial in the world for using topical minoxidil for the female pattern hair loss. Mm -hmm. It came on the market in Australia in 1989 as a prescription medicine. And it's safe. That's the important thing to notice. This is a safe therapy. It lasted as a topical therapy only for about 10 years before, uh, on prescription before it became an over-the-counter medication. So the first thing I want to tell you about the medicine is that it's an over-the-counter medicine. You can buy it from the chemist. I think that highlights its safety profile. Isn't Correct. It? So if anything's available over the counter, it's gone through uh, the very rigorous testing and it is safe. And so they it was a prescription for a while, yeah. but when they realized nobody was getting harmed, they knew they could downgrade it from a prescription medicine to an over-the-counter medication. So this is an important thing for people to know. So minoxidil, how, we don't know exactly how it works, but it does two things that we really want to focus on. Number one, it has an effect upon the hair cycle. Remember we talked about the hair cycle where mm -hmm. we have the growth phase, which yep. we call the antigen cycle. So what minoxidil does is it elongates, it lengthens the antigen cycle. So the way that becomes noticeable to patients is that they decrease their shedding rate. Now the advantage of that is that if you feel that you have a hair loss problem or an excessive shedding problem, 
then being able to slow down the shedding rate is good because first, you're less worried. That's right. And number two, it means more hairs are growing on your head at any one time than otherwise would be the case. That said, I've got to tell you that one thing that does make people nervous is that there is a percentage of patients when they start using minoxidil yeah. that in the first month or two months they notice an increase in shedding rate and they think, my golly, this is supposed to save my hair and yet it's making it fall out even faster. Well, the reassuring thing about this is, number one, it's a temporary phase. Number two, it tells you that when hairs finish growing and they stop being attached to the skin, they sit there till something tugs them out. When you put minoxidil in the system and you start the next growth cycle, it pushes the old oh, hair yeah. out. So the reason that people go through this temporary increase in shedding is because the new hair is it's pushing the old hair out. So that's a good thing. It is not a bad thing. I know, but what we're, what I see and what I'm sure you see is that people go, oh, you know what? I tried minoxidil, topical minoxidil, and it made my hair loss worse. And I was like, you know, this is just, this is horrible. This is not for me. And then they gave up and walked away. And the problem with that is that they've invested in the minoxidil. They've tried it for a few weeks. They've had all the downsides of it, which is that initial shedding, without the benefit. W- without the benefit. And so, you, you know, we also, what we say to all our patients, if you're starting on minoxidil, listen, be prepared for that shedding and power through it because the good stuff is coming, you know, a few weeks so after that. That leads into the whole concept of stimulators in that. If you remember from our discussion on the podcast about the hair cycle, when a hair sheds out, a replacement hair doesn't come through for three months. So realistically, when you're using stimulation therapy, you can't expect the response to happen in weeks. It's gonna happen over a period of months. So for minoxidil specifically, we would say to you, it is four to six months before you're really gonna notice whether you're getting a benefit or not. The first thing you might notice is a reduction in shedding, even if you have that little bit of increase in shedding. But for you to notice an improvement in the quality of your hair and therefore the volume of your hair, forget it, it's not gonna happen in under four months. And you'd be very lucky if you're one of the people to get it at four months. It's more in the second six months. So you've gotta power through, as you said, and be patient. So people who come and say to us that they've tried minoxidil and it didn't work, there are two questions we ask them. Number one is how long did you use it for? Because they may not have used it for long enough. And number two, I ask them to define failure. Mm. Because what they mean is they didn't grow any extra hair. But if I say to them, well, but did you get worse while you were using minoxidil? And I said, well, no. And I said, then my next question is, well, what happened when you stopped using minoxidil? And I said, oh, I got thinner. So I say the first goal of stimulation therapy is to make sure that you're not deteriorating. That's an acceptable result. It may not be your favored result, but it's an acceptable result. And this is something we talk about all the time, isn't it? With, with medical therapy, uh, and I know you say this, I say, is that the goal of medical therapy at the baseline is stability. If we can maintain stability, you and I are gonna be high-fiving our patients all day long, isn't it? That's right, because even if the patient isn't ecstatic, yes. they're not going backwards. That's right. right. This is like leaking bucket it's, therapy, it's right? A, you know, we've got to stop this leak coming out of the bucket. So obviously the second phase, which takes longer for people to notice, is whether they're gonna get improvement. So if you ask what are the percentage success rate of these things, there is, again, it's a complicated thing, so let's walk you through it in bite-sized chunks. First, if you look at the trials, about 40% of people that used minoxidil topically were able to get a noticeable improvement in the quality of their hairs. Now, if we break down that 40% into what that actually means, it is mostly about increasing the diameter of the shaft of the hair. So a weaker hair is becoming a stronger hair, and that's what's producing the notable improvement. There is a little bit of an increase in the number of hairs that will grow at any one time, but the major benefit of using monoxyl is to increase the thickness of the hair shaft. So that's the first thing that people need to understand. That's what we're trying to achieve. So if we look at it from therapy, we're saying you need to be on it because we're gonna stimulate the hairs and we're gonna try and keep them. Now, what I said before is that minoxidil can be used for any type of hair loss, not just baldness in men or female pattern thinning. 
Uh, for people that have uh, had uh, uh, MOLTS, which is a, like synchronized shedding that maybe after the birth of a child, maybe after a fever, maybe after a change of medication, maybe after an acute stressful event, um, even conditions like alopecia, alopecia areata, where it, the immune system switches off the hair follicle, we can stimulate the hair follicle to see if we can get it to come back faster. So that's the benefit of, of uh, using the, the therapy. So yes, 40% of people over time will notice an improvement. There's another 40% of people who just notice that they're not getting worse, at least in the short term, you know, one to two years. So that's the second benefit of it. So maybe 80% of our patients are going to you know, use uh, minoxidil with and some get degree of success, with yeah. some degree of success. And then people say to me, well, you know, how do I, find, how do I know if it's working? I said, well, probably the only way to be sure is to stop it and see what happens. So if you stop the therapy and you stop stimulating the hair with minoxidil, if you notice an increase in shedding some four to eight weeks later, then you know that it was having an impact upon the hair cycle. Right. So sometimes you have to withdraw to the therapy to be sure that it's working. about the therapy. Now, the next thing we need to talk about is what's written on the box. It <laughs> says one mil to be used twice a day. Now there's a reason why it says that. It's because that's what we did in the trial in 1984. That's what we submitted to government in 1985. And so the Therapeutic Goods Administration said, yes, you can, either, you can market it for a mil twice a day. That doesn't really address two critical factors. Number one is how long does the effect last in the skin? The answer is 21 hours. Mm. So realistically, it only has to be used once a day. If you want to use it twice a day, that's fine. You're not going to do any harm. But realistically, you only need to it only needs to be used once a day. The second thing is addressing the one mil. The reason that one mil was the number was that they were trying to standardize how everybody in the trial was being treated. But, but again, in real life situations, some people have a small area of hair loss, some people have a large area of hair loss. So if you have a small uh, area of hair loss, like you would put a cream on a rash, you just cover the area and the amount is the amount. If you've got a larger area, you use a larger amount. So it really doesn't matter about measuring it to the one mil, you don't have to stick to the one mil, you just need to cover the area you're trying to treat. So those are two things I want to emphasize. Number one is once a day, is a very reasonable uh, uh, frequency of use. Number two, treat the entire area you want. Don't just worry about the one mil answer. Cool. So there's a couple of other things, you know, so, you know, sometimes we get a lot of feedback from patients who are, who are on minoxidil or trialing minoxidil. And so here's a few things that we commonly go here. I'm on 5% minoxidil. I hear there's a 7% minoxidil. 7% must be better than 5%. All right, now that sounds like a logical thing until you understand what we call a dose response curve, which means if you increase the dose, do you increase the response, the positive response? So with minoxidil, it works like this. Yes, it works up to about 5% here. All right, at the 5% mark, you're getting this response. If you go to 7%, you might get that response. If you go to 8%, you might get that response. If you go to 10%, you might get that response. It's almost a flat line, right? So basically, the reason behind this is marketing because people believe that stronger solutions work better. So don't be fooled by that. If really 7% or 6% or 8% or 9% was better than 5%, why isn't it available at the chemist? Seriously, why isn't it available? So it is. So as you can see, you know, 5% is applicable across the board. Yes. Theoretically, there's an advantage to 7%, but it's absolutely minuscule and you're not, you know, it's not going to be noticeable by most people. That's and the same is true with the inverse because there is a, a, a version. So if you look at minoxidil, which is Rogaine or Regain that you might see at the, at the chemist, there is a men's version of it and there is a female version of it right. as well. So for men, mostly they will use 5%. For women, you can use 5% or 2%. Now the reason that we have these two different ones is because some women are very fearful of getting increased facial hair from absorption through the skin using the 5%. And the interesting fact is that if you start on 5%, you get a quicker response than if than you start on the 2%. It's not necessarily a better response. So what you can do in this situation is that if we have women who are using 5% and they're noticing a little bit of increased uh, facial hair, we can downgrade them to, 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 to the 2% to help that, because that's reversible, by the way, that increased uh, stimulation is reversible. 
which also tells you if you stop the therapy, you lose the effect. So it is a reversible effect in all cases. So you can often maintain someone on 2% after you've started on, on them for 5%. So that's okay. So the difference between the pink box and the blue box is that marketing pink to the women seems to work better than, than, uh, than just marking the blue men's version. So that again is a marketing principle, not necessarily a science principle. The other thing that we commonly see is people come and say, oh, look, I've started minoxidil, I really don't like it, it makes my hair greasy, or I'm getting really skitchy, sorry, itchy, flaky scalp, and that comes down to the preparation. And in fact, minoxidil comes in two preparations. There's a liquid and there's a foam, and the liquid is, uh, the, the base preparation is propylene glycol, and that can cause uh, itchiness and flaky scalp uh, in about 30% of uh, people that use that. So um, I generally sort of say to people, look, there are two options. The foam is sometimes a lot uh, better tolerated in a lot of people, and it's like comes in a mousse can, you just shake it and you squirt a bit into the, into the cap, and then you can just use your finger or, or a cotton bud just to, to paint it on. And the other key there is that it is, there is absolutely no point in applying the minoxyl to the hair, right? The minoxyl has to be on the scalp. It doesn't do anything if you soak your hair in minoxyl because the hair is, not going to, the hair is effectively dead rope and therefore is not going to absorb and you're not going to get any benefit. So painting it onto the scalp is important. So foam, I find, is better tolerated in it's a lot less, of people. It's less greasy because it doesn't have the PG. The, yeah. yeah. Right, it's PG free, which is the reason they developed it was because, you know, not just the dermatological reaction, the flaking that Vikram was talking about, but also women were finding they were having styling issues with it. So this is why they developed a PG free uh, version of it to do that. But the, the chemistry is interesting too because the foam absorbs quicker through the skin mm -hmm. than the lotion. So the lotion takes 60 to 90 minutes to absorb through the skin. The foam takes 10 minutes to absorb through the skin. So when people are saying, well, when can I wash my hair afterwards or when can I get sweaty afterwards? Um, as long as you uh, have applied the lotion, maybe 90 minutes before washing or sport, you're going to be okay. As long as you put it on 15 minutes before, uh, with the foam for 15 minutes before uh, sport or washing, you're going to be okay. You don't really have to keep it on for four, six, eight hours uh, and wash it out the next morning. It really will absorb through a lot quicker than that. Cool. So in summary, minoxidil really, really has been around for a long time, very safe, really good stimulator of hair growth. It comes in um, a liquid and a foam and the 5% is applicable for most people. And most people don't react. Don't react. Um, and the other thing to note, note that you don't need to take it twice a day. Once a day is perfectly fine. Um, if you take it you know, start taking it, be aware that there is going to be an initial shedding phase after, uh, after you use some it, people, which you may experience some shedding, absolutely. And but power through that and then uh, the growth will come after that. And um, it can, you can take it as an oral form as well. Okay, but that's back to prescription medicine. Yeah. So oral minoxidil is something that's increasingly being used because people don't like necessarily to use a topical solution in amongst their hair. Uh, for styling reasons so you can use a much lower dose uh, uh, rather than the tablet that was uh, used for high blood pressure in fact we use such a low dose that it doesn't affect the blood pressure but again you'd have to have that prescribed by a doctor yeah. uh, somebody who knows what he's talking about like a specialist who works with hair loss would understand this rather than the general practitioner they would be very reluctant to do this so it's a very useful medication for any type of hair loss and it has a role in the treatment of baldness. Um, and most people might start with this first, but it's a short-term therapy for balding, in my opinion, because for most people, it's not targeting the problem, which is the DHT buildup and the follicle. It doesn't have that effect. So it's slowing things down without necessarily stopping. What are your thoughts on compliance? I mean, how you've used it for a long time. Uh, have you seen people going, oh yeah, I've been on minoxidil, once a day, I use it every night, and I've been on it for 20 odd years. Yes, there are people like that, but the truth of the matter is most people waver in, waver out, they stop for different reasons, they forget, they get discouraged, right, because they're expecting it to be better when yeah. in fact it's stable. And often they come to me and say, yeah, I realize when I stopped that I got worse, so maybe I should start back on it again, but is there something better? Mm -hmm. And the answer is there's no 100% answer for anything in hair loss, uh, but it is a very useful medicine and I rank it 
just behind using, in baldness, I rank it behind using blockers first. Uh, in other types of hair loss, I rank it number one. Mm. And, and uh, this is going down another rabbit hole, but you can combine therapies, can't you? The blockers and stimulators. Well, we'll talk about that at the end because yeah. there, is, there are certain conditions where it makes sense to combine a blocker and a stimulator. But certainly, I want you to know it's safe. I want you to know it works pretty well and that it's a very useful part of a treatment program mm. for virtually any type of hair loss. Uh, there are sometimes you might only use it short term, but mostly you're going to have to use it long term. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. I hope that's been of use to you. I think that's great. I, I mean, I think we've got covered a lot with uh, minoxidil. So yeah, I think that's uh, fantastic. And we'll, uh, on the next episode, we'll go through some of the other uh, stimulators uh, uh, for, for hair loss. Okay, but we'll see you next episode. Thank you. See you then.